Greetings, everyone. Welcome. My name is Devin Nahr, and I'm the Isaac al Hadef Professor uh, of Sephardic Studies here at the University of Washington. And it's my great uh, privilege and honor to welcome everyone here today to Tevia's Ottoman daughter, Ashkenazi and Sephardi Jews at the End of Empire, which is a book talk by my friend and colleague, Sarah Zaitis Rosen, who I'm very thrilled to have the opportunity, uh, with whom I'm very thrilled to have the opportunity to discuss her work and her contributions to um, the field. Um, before we get started, um, I'd like to express gratitude on behalf of the Schramm Center for those out there in the audience today who are our community of supporters who have made events like this possible. A special thank you to our co-sponsors in the History Department, Middle Eastern Languages and Cultures, the Middle East Center, and the Ellison Center for Russian and East European and Central Asian Studies. Today's talk would not be possible without the outstanding group of professionals here at the Strom Center who work every day to bring high quality, thought-provoking programming to our audiences in person and virtually. Many thanks to Brendan, Brendan Goldman, Kara Schoonmaker, Grace Elizabeth D, Jenny McCollum, Lauren Ben Susan, and Liv Fowler. Now, the reality is there's no greater joy that a professor can experience than that of having the opportunity to celebrate the publication of their students' scholarship. And that is why today is so important for me personally and for the Sephardic Studies program at the University of Washington and for the Strom Center for Jewish Studies more broadly. Sarah Zaitis Rosen's new book emerged out of her dissertation for which I had the honor of serving as co-director, along with my colleague, Glennis Young, who is the chair of the history department and a specialist in Russian history. Sarah completed her PhD here at the University of Washington in 2017. Her work and scholarship was supported by numerous fellowships, including a Woodrow Wilson Foundation Fellowship, the Titus Ellison Fellowship, multiple Joff Hanauer fellowships, as well as support from the Memorial Foundation for Jewish Culture, Brandeis University, and the Vidal Sassoon Center for the Study of Antisemitism. Now, years later, uh, Sarah has not only published her remarkable book right here, it's so exciting to have the opportunity to hold it in my hands. She is not only an accomplished scholar, with her own book, which we're gonna be discussing shortly, but she is also a friend and colleague, and for the last number of years has served in the uh, tremendously significant role as Associate Director for the Schramm Center for Jewish Studies, during which she has been uh, such a key asset, guiding us across administrative transitions, the pandemic, and so much more. There's a special place reserved for Sarah's work as she's uh, my first PhD student. And I'm honored to share the opportunity to comment on her new book with another of my former PhD students and now also colleague, Janan Bolel, who is our new assistant, uh, assistant professor in Middle Eastern languages and cultures, who focuses on Eastern Mediterranean Jewish languages, literatures, and cultures. So it's very exciting for me, and it's very exciting for us all to be here to learn more about Sarah's book. The way that we're going to move forward is that Sarah is going to take a few minutes to introduce her book, after which Janan and I will address her uh, with a few questions, very hard questions, no doubt. No. <laughs> and afterwards, we'll open things up for uh, Q&A. Uh, you'll notice that you can't see other people here in the web, uh, the Zoom webinar. Um, you do not have your microphones and uh, videos enabled. That's to keep the focus on the presentation. So what I'd like you to do is please submit any questions that come up throughout the comments and discussion uh, through the Q&A function, which you'll find at the bottom of uh, your screen. And please feel free to do that at any point uh, during 
the uh, conversation. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to welcome Sarah Zetis Rosen, uh, Sarah Zetis Rosen to present, uh, uh, to give us a little bit of an intro to her book, Tevye's Ottoman Daughter. Thanks, Sarah, and welcome. Thank you so much, Devin, and thank you everyone for being here today. It's a beautiful spring day in Seattle, and um, it's I think it always just makes it even more exciting to see you all on a, a Zoom webinar to hear about um, a little piece of Jewish history. So thank you all, and thank you also to the staff and incredible faculty at the Strom Center. It is truly a very, very special corner of the University of Washington, and to have served in my capacity as Associate Director for the past almost six years, and really watch it grow, um, and especially watch the Sephardic Studies program grow from basically being, you know, Devin and, you know, me, his student, uh, to really see all these incredible graduate students and now a second uh, hire specific to Sephardic uh, Studies in uh, in milk is is really truly incredible. So thank you everyone for your collegiality and your support and uh, for being uh, here with me today. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. It always gives me a little moment of anxiety. Make sure I do this right. Um, okay, I was told to assume that everything looks good until unless someone says otherwise. So I'm going to assume that every, everything looks good here. Um, okay, let's get started. Oops. So in Shalom Alehem's Tevye the Dairyman, which was later adapted as the classic musical in 1964, and then of course the film in 1971, Tevye's daughters represented three of the typical fates available to Russia's Jews on the eve of the Bolshevik Revolution. So I don't literally mean like the night before the Bolshevik Revolution, but I mean the couple decades that were leading up to 1917. Um, and these were the fates that were available to Russia's Jews, specifically that were living in the Pale of Settlement or the lands that were demarcated for Jewish settlement, first by Catherine uh, the Great, and that ended up uh, being in place until the Bolshevik uh, Revolution again in 1917. So Jews that were living in the Pale could, like Tzedel, one of Tevye's daughters, marry a tailor and presumably remain and die in the shtetl. They can also follow Bilka and her husband uh, to North America, or they could be like Hoddle and her husband Perchik, and they could move on to St. Petersburg and participate in the Bolshevik Revolution and its promises of social and legal emancipation. But the reality is, is that Tevye had more daughters, and we know this from the stories of Tevye uh, the Dairyman, um, but there was also one particular daughter that I have kind of taken the liberty of imagining. Um, and I became incredibly fascinated by her. And I, I call her Tevye's Ottoman daughter because she would have, with sometimes her friends, her family members, made her way to Odessa, to one of the ports on the Black Sea. And she would have crossed the Black Sea to the Russian Empire century old neighbor and foe, the Ottoman Empire, which also happened to control a land that was extremely important to Jewish tradition, Jewish history, and Jewish religion, the land of Israel. So Tevye's Ottoman daughter would have arrived sometime between the years of 1882 and 1919, most likely, and she, when she would have arrived at the port of Constantinople, she would have walked up from the port across the Galata Bridge into the Galata neighborhood. And there she would have encountered an amazingly diverse milieu of Sephardic and other types of Jews. And the Sephardic Jews in particular were descended from Jews who had been expelled from Spain in 1492 during the Reconquista by Ferdinand and Isabella. And yes, for those of you who don't know, it's the same Ferdinand and Isabella who sent Columbus off on his maiden voyage to the new world. And you might know a bit about the history of Jewish settlement in Europe, and it started off in Western Europe and it kind of moved eastward gradually, and it was not a rosy picture by any figment of the imagination. Um, but these Sephardic Jews that had landed in the Ottoman Empire were getting, were very curiously getting ready to celebrate this new fiesta, this new celebration 
um, that they were calling the fourth centennial of Spanish expulsion. So this is 1892, and they were getting ready to celebrate 400 years since the Sultan had opened his arms to the Jewish people and allowed Sephardic Jews to settle in the Ottoman lands. So quick moment back to Russia, as Russian Jews began fleeing in their own kind of expulsion, mostly from pogrom violence and landing often in extreme poverty on the streets of Galata, Sephardic Jews started to cast this really interesting narrative. And they were calling, and they were kind of in the, in the especially in the Ladino press, um, we can see this kind of discourse where Sephardic Jews, who had for many, many years been considered these kinds of uncivilized co-religionists that, you know, the Allianz um, had to come in and, uh, you know, establish schools in order to educate, um, was actually in turn needing to go ahead and and help these Russian Jews, these pobres rusos, as they were called in the Ladino press, and they were supposed, they needed to open their arms to los rusos. Um, and it was their turn to kind of open open their arms, just as the Sultan had opened his arms to the Sephardic Jews 400 years ago. So when I say Los Rusos, I'm referring to them in Ladino, um, and this is the language of Judeo-Spanish, which was the language, one of the many, many languages spoken by Sephardic uh, and Jewish communities in the Ottoman world. Um, um, and it's... Uh, Anyway, it's a very important language. Most of most of these communities also spoke uh, French. Some spoke English, English. Some spoke Hebrew. Some spoke Arabic. It was an incredibly linguistically diverse uh, community, um, and it was an incredibly linguistically diverse empire in which they lived in. So. About seven years ago, I became absolutely fascinated with Tevye's Ottoman daughter, and I became completely fascinated with Los Rusos. And I realized that researching her could lead me to ask some really important big historical questions. So these questions include, why do some immigrants choose to stay where they are? And why do others choose to leave? Why is the why so in the question so difficult to answer? And why is memory, memory just so unreliable? Um, and I always remember this great quote from um, Vladimir Nabokov's Speak Memory as Autobiography, where he says, Anemocene, who's the goddess of memory, one must admit, has shown herself to be a very careless girl. What are the limits of the historical archive? Why is some of this history preserved? And what happens when we acknowledge the limits of the archive? What kinds of histories can we imagine and can we write? And what was at stake for these historical actors? Why would they have made decisions that altered what, were, what was preserved? So in other words, what, were, what was the role of the archivist whose job it was to gather this information and decide what is to be preserved for other generations to come back and, and study? So the question of Tevye's Ottoman daughter and Los Rusos also allowed me to kind of ask very, more specific questions to to this context in which I was looking at. How do how did the Russos how did those Russos problematize Jewish identities in Constantinople? Um, identities like Ashkenazi, Russian, Austrian Jews. How did they relate to the empire? How did anxieties about the white slave trade, uh, to use the parlance of the time, or prostitution, interrelate to Jewish status in Western Europe and in North America? How did a predicted schism between the Ashkenazi and Sephardic community reveal a community debate over the politics of Zionism? And how did a project in the Ottoman borderlands help formulate new questions and answers to the Jewish question? So let's set the scene for Tevye's Ottoman daughter um, in the broader Black Sea region. So I recently Google mapped it and I thought, okay, if I wanted to, um, we're going to meet one of these characters, Albert Kant, um, who's from Kilia in, um, in Ukraine. And if you wanted to kind of come by car, like how, how far is it? And it turns out it's about 13 hours uh, by car. Um, but if you can see my cursor, um, most of Tevye's Ottoman daughters were coming up from this green region over here and they were crossing the Black Sea to Constantinople. And of course, the land of Israel is uh, all the way, all the way down here. So we're looking at this period of time where we have these two kind of 
two of the last great empires of Europe. And these empires were linguistically, religiously, and ethnically so diverse, and they're about to be dismantled and replaced by these nation states based on secular and ideologically informed national identities. And remember that this was all in the context of unprecedented movement of populations and of ideas. And I mean literal movement of people. You had Muslim refugees coming in from Crimea and the Northern Caucasus. At the end of World War I, they were joined by Circassians, Tatars, and Turks from the Russian Empire. Um, you had political turmoil, right, that was causing some of this movement, namely the Bolshevik Revolution, the Russian Civil War, and this all kind of uh, led to the moniker Russia abroad, not just in the Ottoman Empire, and many, but in many other places in Europe, Paris, Berlin, Prague, Sofia, Belgrade. You had movement from the Balkan war, Wars a bit earlier, 1912 to 1913. You had Armenian, the Armenian Genocide, you had populations, population exchanges at the end of uh, World War I. And of course, you had the earlier pogrom violence that uh, began in uh, the late 19th century um, against the, that was state-sponsored violence against Jews that were living in the Pale of Settlement, including the Kishinev pogrom in 1903. So Constantinople and specifically the port neighborhood of Galata became a kind of entrepot a warehouse, not just for the various Jewish populations, but also for Greeks, Jews, Armenians, an incredibly diverse uh, population. And the Galata neighborhood was home to at least three Ashkenazi synagogues. So with an influx of population, we needed to see more places of prayer. And uh, the places of prayer also served kind of they weren't just places of prayer, they're also community gathering houses, and as we're going to discuss, kind of serve to uh, have other functions as well. But um, there was an Ashkenazi community that predated the Russian community, and as, you know, many things are in history, um, a little difficult to, to pin down exactly when they arrived, but the legend says that um, the Ashkenazi community were Jews coming from um, Austria-Hungary that, you um, you know, were so kind of in the Sultan's council that they even served to be like the personal tailor to the, to the Sultan. Um, and so their main synagogue, the Taylor Synagogue um, or the Schneider Temple uh, was named for these uh, tailors that were, you know, that served the Sultan. But with the growing population, um, they decided to build a second synagogue called the Ashkenazi Synagogue, which is still a working synagogue in Istanbul today. Um, and then there was a third synagogue that's actually not quite on Synagogue Street. It's just uh, uh, off to the off to the side a bit. Um, it's called Orchadash, um, and it's a very interesting synagogue because it was also nicknamed the Pimps Synagogue because um, the on the bottom floor uh, was a was a synagogue, and um, on the the levels and the apartments above it were actually was actually a brothel, and the brothel was filled with um, women from many Russian Jewish, well, many Jewish women uh, from, from Russia. And the legend goes that um, the established Ashkenazi community didn't want to have to pray with the, uh, you know, kind of men um, associated of, you know, with the trade of ill repute. And so they needed to build their own synagogue, uh, which, which they did. And uh, the community, the Sephardic community actually allowed it to continue existing as long as it built uh, these really really high walls. And so in addition to these three kind of colorful synagogues, um, Galata was also home to other kinds of religious groups um, and places of worship, including the Armenian Evangelical Church, the Bulgarian Orthodox Church, and the French Roman Catholic Church. And as one of my uh, contacts in Istanbul put it, Galata became a place where Russian emigres rubbed shoulders with the head of the white army who had set fire to their shtetl just a few years prior. So a little bit more about this really special neighborhood. Um, Albert Kant, who I'll discuss in a bit, described this very lively cosmopolitan scene in Galata while visiting the city as a respite from his life on a Jewish agricultural colony next to uh, Yor Yehuda in the Western Aegean. The official language was Turkish, but the Greek, Armenian, Judeo-Spanish, French, English, and German languages were widespread in the district. The Russian restaurants swarmed every way you looked, ranging from the simple to the elegant, and the diverse population came to taste the delicious Russian dishes 
borscht, kasha, blini, shashlik, and other specialties. There were even Jewish restaurants that served stuffed fish, chicken, bouillon with pasta, pate, and other dishes specific to Russian Jews. And this is uh, from Albert Kant's uh, Memoirs of a Jewish Farmer in Turkey. Um, and so before we leave Constantinople in this very quick tour of my book, I want to present some additional historical context. So we know that approximately 11,500 Russian migrants came to the Ottoman Empire legally. Uh, Russian Jewish migrants came legally. But how do we know the numbers exactly? Because the problem is, is that the Ottoman authorities often did not ask what people's religion was at the port of entry. And likely there were more that came through the borders and were claiming to be going elsewhere. Also, this was a time where borders tended to be more porous. It is not unusual for people to show up in one place and kind of slip into the next. And we see this uh, happening uh, in Palestine during the, the period of the first Aliyah. Um, recovering numbers of migrants, especially in a state of political upheaval, is, is very, very difficult. So um, it's, it's not always, um, it's just not always possible to be uh, particularly precise. And my book also engages um, in some of what I call the, the other major Jewish questions. Um, and the title of my book is strategic in two ways. Yes, there is the Shalom Alehem illusion that we already went over, but I'm also trying to underscore by calling it Tevye's Ottoman daughter, the silence and the limits of an incomplete archive and historical record. So throughout my scouring of the archives, I rarely found accounts of any women. So many of the protagonists of my narrative are men, and this is a direct result of the unfortunate reality that Russian Jewish women, both as marginalized migrants and also as women, were not preserved in the archive. And there also um, is another issue um, that the Ladino press, which I used, as well as the uh, archives in Turkey and in Israel, did mention occasionally some woman that stood out to me. And it became apparent that several Jewish communities, including those outside of the Ottoman Empire, became concerned with the growing number of Russian Jewish prostitutes in Constantinople. So while the, while the stories of these women that were often prostitutes themselves were not preserved in the archive, these kinds of Jewish anxieties and movements to do something about the prostitution problem in Constantinople was. So to go back to one of the original questions, why was some of this history occluded from the record? And I have to conclude that it had to do with this Jewish anxiety over Russian Jews' involvement in prostitution. So this anxiety led to the formation of the Jewish Association for the Protection of Girls and Women in 1883, which involved very prominent um, Western European Jewish philanthropists. Um, we saw the uh, Or Hadash in a, in a previous slide. And, um, you know, it kind of led to this, you know, we see, we see this anxiety that's really kind of mapped out for us in the discussions of this association. Um, and, and, and anyway, we see it and we, um, we, we kind of see how the, the, how these historical actors really um, kind of dealt with this anxiety and how truly existential it was for them. Um, so for example, Bertha Pappenheim, who um, students of Freud might remember as Anna O, um, says, if we admit the existence of this traffic, our enemies decry us. If we deny it, they say we are trying to conceal it. Because there was this old anti-Semitic trope that Jews dealt in finance and in flesh. So the fact that prostitution is kind of burgeoning in this port city becomes a major problem for Jewish philanthropists um, and Jews in other parts of the world who are really in an existential, um, have existential fears about their community and um, solving kind of the problem of anti of anti-Semitism. So as Irving Howe put it, Communities struggling for survival seldom rush to announce their failures. So I think it's my role as a historian not to cast judgment um, on, on some of these figures, but to truly try to understand where they were coming from. And that kind of existential threat um, 
that was, you know, must have been extremely, was extremely real for them. I mean, this is the end of the 19th and the start of the early, early 20th century. So I'm going to leave uh, Constantinople for a moment, and I want to kind of go to another uh, place in uh, Anatolia that uh, whose whose Ashkenazi Russian Jewish history um, has been has been a bit forgotten, um, and it begins with um, with one man, um, the Baron Maurice de Hirsch, and I'll, I'll get to him as, um, in a minute. Um, so this historical narrative that was kind of also occluded. Um, was included, I think, for different reasons, because this one actually is in the archive, um, and anybody can go and, and look at it and, and read about it. So when I first arrived, um, my first day at the Central Archives for the History of the Jewish People on the campus of Hebrew of the Hebrew University in, in Jerusalem, um, you know, I had gotten all these grants to, you know, do my archival research, and I, you know, flew around the world to uh, to get to Jerusalem. And, you know, I, I showed up in the archive on the first day and I told one of the archivists there, I, you know, I was there to look at, to research Russian Jews uh, specifically in Turkey. And she said, oh, we don't have any, anything about Russian Jews here. You should go home. And I thought, well, this isn't good. Um, so, you know, I went outside and I had a cup of coffee to regroup. And I said, you know, I'm going to purchase a second cup of coffee and I'm going to bring it to the archivist and I'm going to look at the finding aid anyway. Um, so I did that. And I went in and I looked at the finding aid and I said, oh, this is interesting. There's this Ashkenazi, you know, this file of this Ash Ashkenazi community that's writing to the chief rabbi um, in, in Constantinople. And I said to the archivist, well, you know, what about this? There might be something in here. And she said, well, you know, maybe. So anyhow, one thing led to another. And after cultivating a relationship with this archivist and really starting in this um, kind of archival material that had to do with Russian Jewish uh, Ashkenazi communities writing to the chief rabbi, um, you know, over questions like, you know, the kind of marital status of a, of a woman, um, you know, that was going to be married, things like this. Remember, this is a multi, you know, this is a, an empire that was ruled by confession, by religion. So, um, so the Jewish community uh, governed its own, had its own jurisdiction over things like marriages and, and divorces. Um, and they said, well, actually, you know, we do have this body of material of the Jewish colonization associations, early, early, early activities in Turkey. And I thought, well, this is interesting. Um, and they said that, you know, they weren't on cataloging it yet, but if I could be patient that they would catalog it and I could have access to it. And I said, wow, this is amazing. Um, I will, I will do it. I will keep myself busy reading about, you know, reading through the Ladino press, doing other things until... Um, this body of literature is ready. And it turned out that this was a small but very powerful history about Russian Jews who ended up coming to Constantinople and they ended up going to these, going to end up working and purchasing land on agricultural colonies in the Western, Western Aegean, but they did not, at least not yet, go on to the land of Israel. So how could this be? So it starts with Baron Maurice de Hirsch, and uh, for those of you who are local to Seattle, yes, it's the same de Hirsch uh, at the, as uh, Temple de Hirsch was named was named after. And it began again with a Jewish question, and this time um, de Hirsch was trying to answer the Jewish question, um, in this case as it relates to Jewish homelessness. And in, so de Hirsch was this wealthy Jewish philanthropist. Um, from Bavaria, who specifically wanted to assist Russian Jews who were dealing with pogrom violence and who had this vision for an agrarian self-reliance, but that was within the confines of existing states. So he was not interested in um, sovereign statehood. And um, to Hirsch's ideas predate those of Herzl by a few years. So this, this makes some sense. So he first started to conceptualize the Jewish Colonization Association in 1891, and he did it with the help of a few important people. He wanted to know kind of what was the path to exit, like what was actually possible for Russia's Jews? Like, did Russia's Jews know anything about agriculture? Was this a pipe dream? Where could they go? And um, he ended up um, kind of hiring this really kind of funny figure, um, let's actually putting it nicely. Um, he's not a funny figure. He's like, a, he's a very problematic figure. He's a, a major anti-Semite named Arnold White. Do not Google him. You will not find or look him up in the history books. You will find that he is, you know, extremely, extremely offensive. But 
DeHirsch was a businessman and he thought, okay, you know, I need to go and do some investigative work about the Jews of Russia. I should probably send someone that the Russian authorities can relate to. So anyway, so they send this, he sends this British anti-Semite to go in and do that work and report back kind of on, on the status of Russia's Jews and basically kind of serve as the, as the finding committee. So when Arnold White comes back, the Jewish Colonization Association formulates three principal goals. The first, to assist and promote the emigration of Jews from any part of Europe or Asia, and principally from countries in which they were being subjected to special taxes um, or political uh, or other disabilities to any parts of the world for agricultural, commercial, and other purposes. Two, to purchase gifts for the benefit of Jewish communities or individuals, um, so land, basically. And three, to establish commercial or agricultural settlements on the lands that uh, were acquired. So, um, so the Baron de Hirsch had made a lot of his money on railroads, and um, there were these JCA settlements that existed in kind of in this network, and the most famous of them are actually in South America and Argentina, Santa Fe, Entre Rios, La Pampa, and Buenos Aires, um, but there were also some of these smaller colonies uh, in Anatolia and even in Russia. So Hirsch and Theodore Herzl inevitably needed to meet. So this was the 1890s. Um, the Baron de Hirsch dies in 1896. So there were kind of a few years there where he and Herzl could kind of put their, put their heads together. Um, but Hirsch and Theodore Herzl actually didn't do that because they clashed pretty early on. Herzl requested a meeting with uh, de Hirsch after he heard that the new Jewish Colonization Association was trying to kind of form and he saw, okay, this, there's a better you know, place for you to, to put your dollars and put your support. So he sends the Baron this letter in which Herzl outlines his vision for Jewish national statehood, praising the success and pointing to praising and pointing to the success of German unification. Do you know what the German Reich sprang from? From dreams, songs, fantasies, and the gold black bands worn by students. And that in a brief period of time, the Jewish mass masses could too be trained through tremendous propaganda, the popularization of the idea through newspapers, books, pamphlets, lectures, pictures, and songs. With a flag, you can meet, you can lead men where you will, even into the promised land, he wrote. Men live and die for a flag. It is indeed the only thing for which they are willing to die in mass. And the Baron de Hirsch refused the meeting. He wasn't sold on this idea of Jewish colonization in Palestine. First of all, he was concerned that colonization there specifically was informed by religious memories and historical traditions, which however grand may be, did not constitute a sufficiently solid basis wherewith to secure the immigrants in their new fatherland against new vicissitudes and new misfortunes. The Baron had made his money in railroads and had a particularly difficult time doing business in the Ottoman Empire, so he was really wary of any large JCA investment in the area. And he was also worried, and I think rightly so, about the history of wars between the two empires. Like, going to the Ottoman Empire from Russia was, like, not far enough away from the pogroms for, for the Baron de Hirsch. Russia had also, after all, made many, many attempts throughout history to gain jurisdiction over holy sites in Palestine and also to control Crimea as a means to access the Mediterranean and have better access to global markets. So to Hirsch sets, I point out the danger there is in sending migrants into Asia and Turkey. I know that land better than anybody and better than anybody. Also, I am in a position to judge the misery, deception, and deceptions that await the cultists who could be sent there haphazardly. But things change in organizations and context change. So, you know, his vision in 1891 and his opinion in, 1890, in 1891 had to shift because the number of Russians that ended up crowding the streets of Galata soon made the decision inevitable. So some debate over whether or not Anatolia was supposed to be just a night shelter. Um, but as we know, initial, as I've said, initial goals change and um, the JCA was able to adapt. And the Baron uh, Maurice de Hirsch also re recognized that this was going to be a really great real estate deal. So a little bit of history. In 1888, the Sublime Port froze access of Jews in Palestine unless they were going for very specific reasons, but purchases of land still continued in places like Haifa by Russian settlers. Immigrants, including some Russian Jews, held Ottoman passports of dubious authenticity, and the Ottoman administration admitted by 1914 that the movement of people holding valid password, passports 
was all but, all but impossible. According to memos among representatives of the JCA, they basically strategized as, as long as the JCA didn't specifically make a bid for land in Palestine, they could buy the land or even have it for free elsewhere in the Ottoman Empire, aka Anatolia. And it turned out that the JCA did need to pay for the land, but it was good enough in the prices and terms, so everyone struck a bargain. The Baron Maurice, Maurice de Hirsch agreed to the colonies, and the Russian immigrants could remain close to Palestine, arguing that at one point they can make they can receive their Ottoman citizenship and they could move on to the land of Israel. So, Or Yehuda, uh, they began construction on. Uh, or Yehuda in, after, in 18, after 1898, when the JCA purchased 2,600 hectares on a railway line, about 107 kilometers from Smyrna, or now Izmir. Um, and here is uh, the location of that. And this is an agricultural plan for the agricultural, uh, sorry, an architectural plan for the agricultural school, school of Or Yehuda. The property included a school, a preschool, cheese mill, wine cellar, dormitory, and shops for ironwork working in carpentry. There was a vineyard of over 6,000 sections where each section was named after a prominent Jewish figures. One of the sections was called Montefiore. And by 1900, there were about 94 people living there, including a number of Armenian students, some Sephardic students, and four young men that had come from Mikvah Israel, the famous uh, agricultural school uh, uh, in, in Palestine. In 1910, 15 more Russian families had land at or bought land at or Yehuda, and by the time they were they were relatively industrious, industrious, producing grains, fruit, vegetables, tobacco, wool, olives, and grapes. Over the course of its 20-year tenure, approximately 450 students were trained in the school. Daily life in the school Nikol of or Yehuda began at 7 a.m. with breakfast, and depending on the day, students rotated between religion mathematics, economics, agricultural techniques, botany, geology, veterinary medicine, winemaking, field measurement, construction, and gardening. His instruction was in French, which is very typical of Jewish schools in the Ottoman Empire, but Hebrew and Turkish was also taught. So who were these colonists? There were different different colonists um, that were there for kind of, you know, different situations and different reasons. Um, you had one like Alfred, uh, one of the colonists, Alfred Goldenberg, that I write about in the book, um, later went on to be a teacher in the Allianz schools in Morocco, was born there after he fled, after his family fled the Kishin of Pogrom in 1903. Many of the families were Yiddish speaking that were encouraged to move to Or Yehuda by David Feinberg, who was the local JCA representative uh, that was based out of St. Petersburg. And that was something that, you know, the uh, Baron de Hirsch had negotiated with the Russian authorities to have an, uh, a JCA representative actually be in Russia. And others were like uh, Albert Kant, who published a memoir in French, uh, which was a wonderful addition to my source material, material, but who I consider to be very much influenced by that careless nemesine that Nabokov pointed out to me. Um, and Albert Kant was a fam was a member of a family uh, that was kind of a, a typical situation who didn't live on Or Yehuda, but instead helped, uh, but instead purchased a farm that was just adjacent to Or Yehuda. Oops, excuse me. Um, Albert Kant, whose um, memoir is actually uh, here's the the cover the cover of his fam uh, memoir uh, first looked upon Tickford Chiflick, and I think his description um, is really, really interesting. Um, it was winter time, and he described that everything was gloomy and dirty, but his family had moved there because of its close proximity to the historic homeland of the Jewish people. And despite these kinds of less than favorable first impressions, Kant remained for 30 years, um, he, he remained uh, for 30 years on Tickford Chiflick, going back and forth. Um, at some point in time, he also goes back to uh, where he's from in uh, Ukraine. And then he also ends up going uh, and spending some time in Jerusalem during the nascent Jewish state, returning back to Chick for Chiflik and he, he eventually, he sells it. Um, and he also spent some time in Constantinople where he describes kind of getting involved and getting inspired by um, the Balfour Declaration uh, and the ideas of Theodore Herzl. So colonists um, like Kant, um, for a period of time and, and several others kind of eventually become enchanted with Constantinople. 
um, and what would later become Istanbul. They spent time there, they traveled back and forth, um, somewhat to the Russian Empire, and, the and eventually political instability in the region, again, drove them to leave, either making their way to the land of Israel, to North America, or to Western Europe. Um, Kant is kind of one of the few exceptions that um, ends up uh, dying in uh, in Istanbul, but not without um, you know spending some time uh, some time abroad. So by 1924, the JCA lands that um, had been mostly sold, and the remaining funds were used to help purchase land for Jewish settlement in Palestine. So, I guess the question is, why research this? Um, this particular, you know, Jewish colony. This was pretty small potatoes when it's compared to the most successful Jewish agricultural project of all, which is the state of Israel, right, in, um, in 1948. But as I've learned working for the Strom Center for um, past almost six years um, at the University of Washington, is that there's often a lot of disagreement about what a secure future for Jewish people might look like. And I often found a lot of solace in my research uh, to understand that these disagreements weren't new and they weren't novel. Um, but I also found something else that was really important to raise. And this is something I go into the book, uh, I go into in the book, but it's that often all the players, the philanthropists, the administrators, the colonists, the, you know, the teachers, everybody, um, they're often very much involved in a lot of different organizations that often have really competing kind of political views and agendas that shift over time. So organizations like the JCA and the Allianz and another organization, the B'nai uh, Barit Lodges that again, I go into um, the book, like kind of serve to me to, to remind me that, you know, a lot of these disagreements and these discussions and debates, they're not new. They're a very, in fact, important historical question. And I think there's a lesson here. And that's exactly why I find Tevye's Ottoman daughter so worth studying. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sarah, for, oh, I got a weird lighting situation here, sorry, for sharing your uh, insights from your book. I, I do hope that folks will have the chance to read it um, it's been great to see how it's transformed from the dissertation uh, into the book. And I think just for folks out to, to recognize how important this book is, I mean, it's really the first study that investigates those interactions that you described between Jews from the Russian Empire and the Ottoman Empire, rather than thinking about those stories in parallel. Uh, there's Yiddish here and there's Ladino here, but really thinking about the ways in which these different kinds of Jewish communities interacted um, and uh, they encountered tensions around the ideologies, around the organizations that you mentioned, but also coalesced and cooperated in really interesting and fruitful ways. And I think it's really important, uh, you know, to point that out. And so I guess my first question is, and then I'll, uh, you can respond and then turn it over to Janan who can uh, offer a question and comment and then open it up for further questions, which is, you know, reading your book uh, now and thinking about the dissertation, something that struck me even more strongly this time, I think, was the categories that you use and the way in which you reveal, maybe they're not that helpful in a certain way, which are th these two major categories of Ashkenazi and Sephardic Jews. And you have a really interesting set of comments uh, uh, that help us actually disaggregate these categories. And I was hoping that you could tell us a little bit about um, how you have come to understand Ashkenazi Jews and Sephardic Jews at the intersection of these empires, but maybe more broadly, like who are the Ashkenazi Jews and the Sephardic Jews in your in your story? Is Sephardic, does it mean Ottoman? Does Ashkenazi mean Russian? I know the answer is no, but could you help us sort of map it out for for our listeners here, because I think it's a really, really important point that you uh, that really comes to the foray in your in your discussion here. Yeah, it's a really it's a really good point, and um, I um, you know even when I did like my little subtitle after the colon of my book, I was like, well, you know, it's not really about Ashkenazi and Sephardi <laughs> Jews, but I'm gonna I'm gonna go with it because you know you gotta kind of pick a title at the end of the day. Right. But well, it's the shorthand. It's a shorthand that seems right. familiar and. Uh, comprehensible, but what you do is unpack those terms in really profound ways. 
Yeah, correct. So what I try to do as much as possible when it comes to kind of how people talk about themselves is to stick to how people talk about themselves and let the historical actors determine the language that I use. Um, so, and if it's confusing, it's because, you know, I don't think anybody is clear on like who they are ever at any point, you know, it's very, it's like very much like kind of an evolving discursive process, but, you know, these quote unquote Ashkenazi Jews really were, there were, there were a couple groups of Jews. There were Jews that, um, you know, called themselves Ashkenazi Jews, but they were really Jews from Austria-Hungary. And at a certain point, they start calling themselves German Jews to differentiate themselves from the other kind of problematic Ashkenazi Jews, which were these Russian Jewish, you know, the poor Russian Jews and the oh, and even worse, like the poor Russian Jewish prostitutes and pimps that were coming in um, from, from the Russian empire. Um, and I think in, you know, in terms of the Sephardic community, what I think, you know, ends up happening, uh, for the Ladino speaking Sephardic community that also had its own synagogues that, you know, other people have written about, and it, you know, really deserves its own kind of scholar, you know, scholarly attention is that they are also using kind of this contrast, this othering process with Russian Jews to define who it is that they are who had for so long been kind of, you know, defined as this orientalized other by the Western European Ashkenazi Jews in the, you know, in the context of the Allianz schools that were there to civilize, you know, these, uh, to civilize these Oriental Ottoman Sephardic Jews. So it's very, it's very complicated. And um, I think that, you know, as, like I said, as much as possible, I really try to uh, kind of disentangle um, these categories in the book and really let the sources and the act and the uh, actors kind of historical actors speak for themselves. That's thank you very much. I think that really helps. It's a it's a big conversation, but what you the gloss that you provide really I think helps provide us with the framework for understanding that. And I mean, you go into great lengths to describe. Actually, they were organized not only in separate synagogues but institutionally separate synagogues, separate sort of chief rabbi structures, and all of that kind of thing. So. Even the, the thought of the Jewish community becomes, you know, it, there's a very deep multidimensionality to it that you bring to life across the empires from Istanbul to Palestine and then the Anatolian, uh, you know, or Yehuda and the agricultural society. So a very rich portrait that you present us of different Jewish communities in conversation and in, uh, and in tension with each other. I'm going to turn it over to uh, to Janan to take it from here. Hey, Devin, um, Sarah, this is amazing as always. I think it's incredible how multi-layered this history is with actors, with mobility, and especially forming and reforming of local identities. Um, actually, I have only two questions, and I would like to hear from the audience, but... Um, my first question is a bit, again, I will go back to the title of the book. So I want you to elaborate a bit more on this concept of the end of the empire. Um, all of this was, a, as we all know, it was a gradual ending rather than an abrupt one. Um, but I, I'm really curious how it was, con how it was conceived and performed among uh, Russian Jewish migrant, migrant communities and how did it affect their relationship with um, the surrounding Jewish communities, with the land itself, their identity, their, the new country and the old country and plural countries, right? So, yeah. Yeah, I think it's a it's a very interesting question, and I and I like that you say that you know it didn't it didn't end so abruptly, right? Um, that this was kind of a process, and and really it was a process that all kind of became began unfolding just as these Russian Jews were arriving, and I think that that kind of um, almost in a way the. I don't want to call it transitory because for many, it wasn't transitory for many, you know, like these Russian Jews did come and, and these were not, you know, huge numbers. This was not, you know, you can't compare it to migration patterns to New York or, you know, to, to Montreal or anything like that. But, um, you know, so many of these Russians arrived just as things started to get, you know, to become political, right? We have the Young Turks uh, in 1908. Um, in the Ottoman, you know, in the Ottoman context, you have, you know, these, you have 1905 in Russia and then later 1917. Um, and I think that there's also kind of this, this concept of 
you know, kind of the, the kind of multi-directional kind of nature of the migration, like just because these Russian Jews, you know, and I, I didn't, I, I glossed on it just a little bit uh, in the talk, but just because they came to the Ottoman Empire doesn't mean that they stayed there. Some of them actually went back to the Russian Empire um, and they went back for various reasons. I mean, some of them like fell in love, um, you know, others had family, others had, you know, thought that the Bolshevik promise like might be something, you know, that's kind of interesting. I, that was one of the, um, what, anyway, one of the, the, the characters that I found, the historical actors that I found. Um, so I think it's a it's a really good question. And I think like, you know, especially this kind of question of identity and, um, you know, the fact that there is still a Jewish community in Istanbul is very interesting to me that we're descended from these um, historical actors. You know, I went and I, um, I think that in, in 2015, that number was about 10,000. Um, and, and the Ashkenazi community is a, is a minority of that, uh, of that Jewish community in Istanbul. But, you know, the fact that you have you know, gravestones and the kind of final resting places, um, you know, in the in the cemeteries in Istanbul, I think is also very telling that, you know, for some people, they, you know, they stayed and they found Turkey to be, you know, a promising, a promising home, um, you know, based on whatever ideals and identities that, you know, was helpful and useful for them at the time that they made that decision. Thank you, Sarah. In my... <clears throat> And second question, I, I always love listening to archival stories of historians and researchers. So um, in your book, actually, you say that there is more work to be done and more archives to be visited, which is always the case, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, so my question is, if there were no limits, no limits like linguistic, time, budget, travel, personal, etc., which archive would you like to include in this research or your next project? Um, I, I'm very curious about this, actually. Thank you for answering and for asking that question. It's it's also my like one of my favorite questions. So, okay, as of 2016, the Ashkenazi there's actually material about the Ashkenazi community in Istanbul um, that has still not been. Um, I shouldn't say given. I don't know what the right word is. Like when we talk about when we talk about archives, but it, it hasn't it hasn't been archived yet. Um, and it's kind of like this political weird story that it's like held on by this one guy um, and people were kind of waiting or like waiting for him to basically die and then um, hopefully get their hands on the archive. But it's, it's just very political. Archives in general are, you know, as you know, very, very political. And for the audience that doesn't know, um, you know, most of the material that had pertained to Jewish communities after the Second World War uh, was sent to Israel. And um, people feel very differently about this. Um, I personally feel, you know, like for a professional, for a historian, this is like the greatest thing ever because you go to Israel and everything's in one place. It's a, it's a very useful thing. But for people for whom that this is their, you know, these are their memories and this is, and this is their material. Um, I guess there's some discussion about, you know, kind of material that left Turkey that was supposed to come back and never did. So I guess that's my pie in the sky um, is to really, uh, is to get my hands on that Ashkenazi ar archive. I, I did get to look at some of the material that, um, it's not archival material, it's just material um, that was housed in the, specifically in the Ashkenazi synagogue. And um, I was really aided by um, uh, a rab the rabbi that was working out of that synagogue. Um, and I was allowed kind of into, you know, personal family archives, photos, you know, to both things like that, uh, which was really, really remarkable. But, um, you know, of course, the dream is to one day have, you know, an archive that's, you know, accessible and, um, you know, organized and, yeah. Um, actually, I will merge one of my questions with one of the audience questions. Okay. Um, and my question is actually, in what ways is the book or the dissertation in the first ways is different from the dissertation you set out to write. So this is the first part of the question. And the second part comes from Colton. Um, he's among the audience. And his question is, what is one piece of advice you have for emerging historians beginning archival research based on your experience writing this book? My research in Berlin this summer, like yours, will take place in a foreign language and in unfamiliar institutions. Um. Great. I will start with Colton's question because I actually just forgot your question as I was reading Colton's question. 
Um, so I'll start with Colton. Um, the piece of advice for emerging historians, Colton is one of our um, undergraduate students um, who um, is already going to be starting um, his uh, archival research. I guess like my question is to become friends with the archivists. Um, first of all, you know, learn every language possible, which is impossible. Um, you know, so like, you know, figure out what language the material actually is in. Um, I think that was the, my biggest shock of going to the archive. I don't know why, but, you know, I spent all this time like studying Arabic and studying Ladino and Russian and which was all very, very useful. I'm glad I did those things, but then I showed up and everything was in French and I thought, well, that's nice. Um, you know, <laughs> it's kind of easier, a little simpler to decipher because that was the lingua franca. So I think to really understand, you know, to get really get a handle on the archive, which is really a historical question. You have to understand so much about history to then, you know, know what's in the archive. And really to befriend the archivists. Um, they become your best friend, Colton. Um, and I think, you know, in my in my experience, um, you know, I just I just had the loveliest experience in the archives. First of all, many of the archivists are um, Jews from the former Soviet Union, and they really, um, anyway, I you 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 realize like just how professional and how educated these archivists are, and um, you know just what kind of amazing people, um, at least the ones that I've worked with with are, and so really befriend them and be patient with them and um, understand that they are really doing important, important work, um, preserving the history and memory of the of the Jewish people. Um, and I think as much as, I don't know, you know, for me, I think it kind of gave me some access uh, that I maybe otherwise wouldn't have had. So I think, you know, study languages, figure out exactly what languages you're going to need in the archive and befriend the archivists. Did you so speak to them in Russian? Sorry, did you speak to those archivists in Russian at all? Or? Of course I did. Yeah. Of course I did. And they were very, very concerned, not just about the work that I was doing, but also, you know, how cold are you? They would remind me that it was time to break for lunch. Uh, you know, they'd bring me rugula. Like it was just, it became like a real, um, you know, <laughs> I don't know, like a family project uh, when I was there. Um, yeah. What, sorry, what was the second part of the, what was the first part of the question, John? <laughs> the first one was like, in what ways did the, the dissertation, uh, the book you set out to write kind of? Yeah. You know, so I think like the, the biggest, most obvious piece that I almost am like afraid to admit in like a public setting in which I'm probably being very judged right now, but I like forgot to talk about World War One in my dissertation very much, which I figured was like a major mistake. Sorry, Devin. Um, I'm sure I talked about it just enough to pass, but um, I really got more into uh, World War I. Um, and also, you know, the nice thing about living in the digital age is that once you finish your dissertation, like new archives emerge that have been digitized. Um, so I was very fortunate to be able to use uh, the Joint Distribution Committee's archives. And I found like a, a really like interesting material that I was uh, able to incorporate. Um, and I, I talk about the shatter zones. Um, you know, this was like a very kind of interesting piece for me in my dissertation that I think became a little bit less so uh, in the book for various reasons. Um, I think just to make the make the book a little bit more kind of history focused rather than kind of theoretical. Um, but in my dissertation, I was kind of really interested in this idea that like borderlands were the site of this really like unique kind of. Um, political and kind of identity projects because it was kind of far from the seat of power. And this is where, you know, kind of Russians and, you know, Armenians and Greeks and everybody kind of, you know, rubbed elbows and um, they were just kind of, and they're also kind of the sites of, um, of some very major violence. Um, and so I think I, I moved away a little bit from that um, in the book, um, just kind of really wanting to prioritize uh, telling the story of these historical actors uh, rather than kind of theorizing about that. Perfect. So um, this is your, this is McKenna's question, sorry. Uh, McKenna asks, can you speak more about the languages of instruction at the JCA school? Even with the context you provided, I was still surprised to hear that French and Turkish were part of this educational project. Why not teaching and about Hebrew exclusively if the ultimate destination for many was the land of Israel? Would there have been too much ideological pushback if Hebrew alone was adopted or was it just impractical to teach only Hebrew? 
So I would have loved to have um, an archive that would have addressed this question in the language politics specifically. Um, but I think that the reason that French was um, still kind of the primary language was because the JCA and the Allianz actually ended up partnering on these agricultural colonies. And the Allianz was a French school and they were using a lot of French teachers that were coming in, Allianz teachers that were coming in and teaching at Or Yehuda. So I think um, part of this is extremely, like it's a practical answer. Like this is the language that most people are speaking, right? It's French. Um, and I actually think that the fact that they were speaking Hebrew was actually pretty revolutionary, you know, considering that this is emerging out of like, you know, the Baron de Hirsch's kind of, you know, reluctance to really do anything that was, you know, that would signal to the Ottomans that they were trying to, um, you know, to kind of make a go for it uh, in Palestine. So um, I think it's a really interesting question, McKenna, and um, I can, I hope that you uh, maybe will, you know, do some of your, do some of that research while, while you're um, pursuing your PhD at, at Stanford, um, so I would, I would also like to know more. Okay, um, this is Ellen's question, and I hope I'm pronouncing this right, Bilu, B-I-L-U, and other early Zionists sometimes operated out of Constantinople. The Bilu Manifesto was issued from there in 1882. Can you add anything about this aspect of early Zionist history? Um, you know, I actually don't know much about this history. Um, it's kind of predates a little bit of when I, you know, when I looked at it. Um, I will tell you that there was very, very interesting Zionist activity that started after 1908, um, in particular that emerged out of the B'nai B'rit movement. Um, and uh, I, I didn't go into this in the talk, but there was just absolutely fascinating, um, you know, once basically once censorship was lifted, um, Zionism really became much more, you know, really became something that was, you know, a topic of discussion in various newspapers. Also, there were new, new, new newspapers that emerged on the scene um, in Constantinople and later Istanbul that discussed um, Zionism. So I would really, um, you know, kind of maybe welcome the opportunity to speak with you, um, Alan Dowdy, uh, kind of se separately on that. But um, I do have two chapters in the book that um, that cover this, but a little bit, uh, I think, later than the the period that you're you're looking at. Right. So this is Morris's question. It is my understanding the Spanish Jews expelled from Spain who are given citizenship in the Ottoman Empire. Is that true? And if so, were Ashkenazi Jews who seem to have immigrated much later to the Ottoman Empire also granted citizenship? So yes and no, and it depends on who you were and where you were where you were coming from. Um, it's a it's a complicated it's a complicated question. Um, and the migrants that I were looking at that I was looking at, some of them were granted citizenship, um, and that's and some of them were not. Um, so it it just depends on. On, it depends on, on a lot of different factors. Okay, very interesting questions. And this comes from Reshat. And I'm, real, I'm also very interested in, in this question. Uh, so um, I was wondering about the farm around Izmir. You said that it was sold in 1923. And the process proceeds were used to purchase land in Palestine. Do you know who bought this farm? It's a very good question, and I'm, I, I, I want to know too. <laughs> I guess is my. Um, this is kind of one of those questions where I kind of after the fact learned about the the sale. Um, I I don't know who purchased it, um, but I I can I, I I will I will plan to find out, Rasha, and get back to you. Um, and the proceeds were you basically all the proceeds from uh, the JCA farms that were sold um, were centralized into this. Um, like into a new uh, fund, and the fund was then used to kind of give out loans and purchase purchase land in Palestine. And I think that um, probably others work um, specifically on Palestine um, would be more helpful. And actually, the JCA is still in existence. Um, I think there's still there's still money in that fund that's uh, being used to assist Jews in Israel. This is Marshall's question. Some of the early settlers into Israel during the first Aliyah carried with them the idea that they were bringing a superior culture into the land versus the existing culture. This bias was present in Western culture at the time. Do those you see in your book share the same bias, especially those who were more at an economic disadvantage compared to the local population? 
Um, this is a very good question. Um, I, I did not really see that. Um, well, that's not true. I did see that um, in people like it, but I, I saw that bit in kind of in 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 some in some of the sources, and then some of the sources I did not see that. Um, Kant definitely considered himself to be kind of, um, and this is not in the period of the first Aliyah. He came a little later, but um, he definitely saw himself as someone that carried kind of high Russian culture with him, right? And even in the description that he gave of this, of Or Yehud, of uh, not Or Yehuda, but the farm that his family purchased next door, like was very much this like, you know, oh, everything was dirty and terrible and, and it was very hard work and it was like very agricultural centered. Um, but he describes like reading the classics of, you know, not just Russian, but, but Western European uh, classics. Um, and I think that that, you know, it's a memoir. I mean, you know, um, Kant published the memoir, memoir decades after kind of his experience on this agricultural colony. So, you know, I think like, what did he bring when he actually was, you know, meeting with his Armenian neighbors and his Sephardic, you know, co-religionists on Or Yehuda? Uh, like, he doesn't kind of discuss it in, you know, we, we don't know how that happened, right? He's remembering it from, from decades later and kind of how he's positioning himself vis-a-vis um, other, pop not just other Jews, but kind of other populations in the Ottoman world. Um, so, you know, it's a very, very good question. I would say that the, um, you know, that the people that I saw kind of the most um, kind of like orientalizing behavior from was uh, the Ger the people that were calling themselves German Jews. Um, so not the Russian Jews, but the, but the German Jews, um, you know, in the way that they, you know, not spoke, not just spoke about, you know, the, the Russian Jews, but also um, Sephardim. And then also from Sephardim who were, you know, writing about Russian Jews too. Um, so it's a very, very, very interesting process. And it, it reminds me of a quote, every other has their other, um, which I, I talk a little bit about in the book, but, um, you know, again, I, I really try like as a, as a historian, not to cast too much judgment, but just kind of make observations, um, and to kind of ask like, what was at stake that, you know, some people might, you know, have cast their, co-religionists um, in this in this light, um, but it's a very, very important question. Thank you, Marshall, for asking it. Okay, next we have Leora's question. Um, I'm curious in what ways you employ the category of settler colonialism to help you understand the thought processes that went into efforts to settle Russian Jews in Anatolia? Um, I don't, actually. Um, I I only really encountered this term settler colonialism kind of after I published the book, um, or I, I guess I, I did the work. Um, you know, these were, um, if anything, like I kind of considered them as, you know, somewhere in between Zionism and territorialism. And I kind of situated the debate between um, that, um, that there were kind of, you know, I saw the JCA and I understand that, you know, colonial, you know, col col the Jewish colonization association was part of that, um, but they weren't colonizing, you know, Palestine. They were actually specifically not colonizing Palestine. They were specifically not, you know, looking at, um, you know, they were looking at these projects that want, that, that retained their, uh, that retained kind of national sovereignty. So they weren't like looking to kind of, you know, create a new uh, political system. Um, of, any, of any kind, they were just looking to be autonomous, and that meant kind of agriculturally like self self sufficient. Um, and there were other kinds of these like uh, territorialist projects. There was a great book by Adam Rovner um, that writes about them, and I think um, it's actually going to be going out as a recommendation um, in the newsletter that we send out after after this talk as a post event resource. So, um, yeah, truthfully, that's that's kind of that's where I saw it. I didn't see. Um, the sources weren't speaking about it in those terms. Um, and, you know, the uh, Baron de Hirsch, you know, when he was talking, when I, when I was reading his work in relation to um, the colonies in Turkey was also not using those terms. So I try to just as much as possible kind of stick to, stick to the terms that the historical actors were using um, and think of it as terms of like, what, you know, what were the, what were the, the goals? So um, yeah. Okay. Um, we have one last question, then maybe Devin, if you want to jump in and 
some comments or a question, but the last question from the audience is, actually we have one more about archives and we can go back to that by Emily. Um, so this question about when we think about the already existing Ashkenazi presence in the Ottoman realm. So what was the relationship between the newcomers and already existing Ashkenazi groups in 19th century? Um, yeah, I think this is Al Maimon's question. There's yes. a right. Oh, okay. yeah. Great. So um, yes, there was a long time Ashkenazic presence in Turkey, um, and I, you know, I know about the presence that was in uh, Constantinople, um, and so I think, um, you know, there was that old. Uh, Taylor Synagogue. Um, I think this is like one of the kind of interesting, you know, interesting connections is that the relationship with the newcomers was that, you know, they needed a place to pray and that needed to be a different place to pray because we're not going to be praying with these, you know, pimps and prostitutes, basically. Um, so there was a kind of, um, you know, there was that element to the relationship, but also there was this very important um element to the relationship, which was that, and I always think of Devin in his book when I do this, because he, he quotes like an amazing, amazing Sephardic proverb that I just love. And it's that a local cucumber and a foreign rabbi is always preferred. So the Ashkenazi community um, understood what that means, first of all, is that like you can't get a cucumber like you can get in the Mediterranean world, like you just can't get that in Seattle. But really, if you have to solve a problem, you have to bring in a foreigner, like a foreign leader, a foreign rabbi, you know, foreign whatever, you know, CEO, executive director, what have you, to come and solve like an internal community's struggles. And I didn't go into it in this talk, but there was a very important rabbi named um, Rabbi David uh, Fievel Marcus that was a, um, a Russian Jewish rabbi that was educated um, in the Netherlands. And he ended up uh, being recruited by the Ashkenazi community to lead um, the Ashkenazi community um, in particular that could appeal to kind of the Russian sentiment, I think one of the one of the terms was. And um, Rabbi Marcus ended up leading um, also the Goldschmidt School, which was um, one of the schools for, uh, it was like the German Jewish school that was kind of like the counter to the Allianz School for Sephardic Jews. Um, and he ended up being a really interesting figure because he kind of like, well, he kind of, he clashed with um, the chief rabbi, Haim Nahum, who was the Sephardic chief rabbi, and he constituted this like, this kind of secondary uh, rabbinical uh, position. So the Ashkenazim like ended up kind of reporting to uh, Marcus, and there was anyway, another rabbi that predated him in the 1890s. But anyway, the kind of the majority of this happened when um, these, the Ashkenazi ended up kind of reporting to Marcus and Marcus kind of was at odds with Haim Nahum and anyway, all kinds of really interesting intercommunal kind of tensions uh, happen that I, that I go in, that I go into the book, but, um, you know, Rabbi Marcus was really quite a remarkable um, uh, teacher and, and rabbi, and uh, he also became um, a very avid Zionist, um, so that caused some problems uh, with Rabbi Nahum, uh, who was very much pro-empire. We also have, uh, I think maybe it was Al Maimon who shared with us for the Sephardic Studies collection some letters related to uh, from Marcus pertaining to some Jewish families uh, that wound up here in Seattle. I think we may at some point we talked about that. Um, maybe I could, if I could interject another question because you have talked a little bit about you know the pimps and the prostitutes and that is. I mean, there is a kind of a, um, a stereotype in a certain sense in the Ottoman world uh, around Russian, Russian Jews in particular, um, you know, being kind of uh, pigeonholed with this discourse. I mean, there's, you know, when uh, Ben Gurion went to Salonika, he basically, he describes in his memoirs that the local Jews were very circumspect about him because they thought he must be a pimp because that's yeah. what they associated, you know, with Eastern European Jews. So could you say a little bit more about that, the image and the reality, like, and how, I mean, there were obviously some Jews from Eastern Europe who wound up in the Ottoman Empire who did partake um, in the, you know, in the white slave trade. They were pimps and prostitutes. Can you speak a little bit about how that involvement developed and, you um, and sort of what the relationship is between the that that sort of the image and the the social reality that may have undergirded it. 
Yeah. So it's, um, you know, in terms of like, how real was this? Like, well, it was pretty real. Um, you know, and I think, um, you know, one of the things that makes it maybe appear more real in, um, especially in the Galata neighborhood is that like, it's, you're right up from the port, right? It's kind of like this natural, and I mean, I don't know, it's the 19th century, right? It's a port city. Like this is kind of the reality of, of a port city. Um, and, you know, we, and it doesn't mean that there weren't Russian Jews that, you know, weren't pimps and, and prostitutes. Of course there were, and many of them are in my book. Um, but, you know, and, and, and actually the reality um, is also that we just, you know, we, we don't, we just don't know that much. What we know is like police records, how many were rounded up, how many were deported, you know, how many were sent back. Remember, this is it's a system of capitulations, right, where you're governed by basically your home, um, uh, you know, you're, you're governed by, you know, the your place in which you kind of had, had, even if you were living in the Ottoman, Ottoman citizens. So it's hard to kind of get at the number, but I think that, um, you know, the, the reality is just that it was a very, very visible kind of trade. Um, and it's, it was, it was particularly visible, um, in the port. Um, and yeah, I mean, I, you know, I remember reading that line, um, in Ben Gurion's memoir as well. Um, and it's, it's really kind of shocking. And, um, I think, you know, I, I don't know, it, it's, it's hard to, again, because these are marginalized people, this is, we're talking about a marginalized group of people. It's really hard to study them in a kind of, a, in a historical sense, right? You're, you're, they're not like the archivists that, you know, said, okay, like, we're going to, you know, look at the whole body of material that's here in, um, you know, in Istanbul, we're got to figure out like what we're going to preserve. There weren't sitting there going, okay, like, let's definitely preserve the story of these prostitutes, because, you know, first of all, it's not like they're leaving like a really detailed paper trail most of the time. And second of all, like, you know, if you want like for the, you know, when you're dealing with like an existential kind of anti-Semitic, you know, worldview, right? This is right after the second world war, like probably you're not going to kind of get back into that trope that I described about Jews dealing in finance and in flesh. So, um, I think, I think there's, there's that reality, but we also, um, you know, my next book project, should there ever be a, a second um, book, book project, is that I found a really wonderful moment of agency with these two, with two, 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 two former prostitutes from Russia. Um, and that was that there were these two prostitutes that ended up buying Or Hadash, that pimp synagogue, and they turned it into a home that was like a, a refuge for women who wanted to leave, for Russian Jewish women who wanted to leave the trade. And it ended up becoming like the Jewish um, old age home, like later on, I think like in the seventies, I want to say. Um, and you could tell from the the slide that I, I showed, it's like the, the building is totally, you know, it's like almost gone, um, but you can still see like, you know, some Hebrew, um, you know, over the kind of the front facade of the of the building. So, you know, even though it might be difficult to get to like really what were the realities, what were the numbers, what were the percentages, like we know that there were there were still instances of, you know, of remarkable agency. And I think that that's, you know, really what's important. You're leaving us with a fascinating anecdote, but I think we can take one last question from Mary. Can Mary ask a question? Mary, can you ask your question? Yeah. Mary is our fabulous uh, Jewish studies librarian at the University of Washington. Mary, go ahead. Or maybe it was an accident. Well, maybe while we're waiting uh, for Mary, we see Brendan uh, chimed in here with a, a question about how you see your work in relationship to sort of the lacrimose narrative of Jewish life in you know in the in the Muslim world. This uh, you know a, a history of tears. You know, do you feel that um, the Russian uh, Jewish experience? Uh, in the Ottoman Empire teaches us about how benevolent or malevolent Ottoman uh, rulers were with regard to Jewish subjects. Um, how do your actors express the views of the merits of the Ottoman, uh, of Ottoman rule in comparison to the Russian czars? 
This is a fantastic question, um, truly. Um, I think that the, you know, it, it's, a very, it's a very interesting question. Like I, I'm always interested in like how, not only are how populations govern, but how populations view how they are being uh, governed. Um, and I think that the answer is, is that it's not always what you would expect. Um, and I say this because some of my, and it's interesting because actually some of my sources like end up writing more about um, the Russian Tsars and the Russian empire than they do about the Ottoman empire. I'm talking about the Russian Jews specifically. And they kind of didn't get included in the book for this reason, because I'm like, I'm like, well, wait a minute. I'm like supposed to be writing about the Ottoman empire. And instead like there's all these anecdotes about the Russian empire. So maybe, I don't know, that's book three or something. Um, but what I have found is that the kind of like the narratives have been like one of two things about special specifically about the Russian SARS. And one of them is like, you know, they were terrible. They came after us. The pogroms were awful. We're leaving and we're never looking back. Um, and I think the same is just this, the same truth can be told, by the way, about, um, you know, immigrants in other like that ended up moving other places. This is not unique to Russian Jews in the Ottoman Empire. So there's like that kind of mental, you know, kind of uh, narrative. And then there's this also this narrative of like, oh, like, you know, Tsar Nicholas was this kind of like, you know, you know, cultured kind of interesting thing in the and the royal family. And there was this, you know, kind of like almost like a benevolent, like I mean, almost like a, a benevolence that's kind of cast about some of the Tsars, um, including sometimes Catherine the Great, who was like, you know, really not good for the Jewish people, um, but sometimes still like remembered that way. Um, so I think that like, that's also really interesting. And I think it kind of goes back to like how, you know, people who have been set, like people who've been forced to move, I think especially don't really remember that I don't know. They, I think they cast certain narratives about like what, you know, the pl the places that they left in order to justify the places that they came to, if that makes sense. So, so do you feel though on the lacrimose piece about the, how do you, would you, uh, do you have a comment about the Ottoman context? And do you, do you get, did they comment or was maybe the comment is no comment, which suggests that in comparison, it was benign. I mean, is that, would that be the implication, the Ottoman context versus the yeah, I'm of the czars or yeah, I'm trying to remember a source that even that even spoke about the sultan, and I think like, you know, it, it's like I think I think you're right. I think the com th there was an absence of it almost, um, and I think, you know, if anything, like they were very much interested in the I don't know, they, like the the comments were, if anything, the comments were more about like the chief rabbi than it was about the sultan, mm. um, and. Um, but there was very little kind of, yeah, I, you know, I'd have to go back and look, Brendan. Um, and I think it's, it's a very interesting point, but nothing, nothing stands out to me, but I think really, again, like the comments were about the Russian side and, um, really about like, you know, the, the Jewish millet system in which the Russians were, um, operating under. Perfect. Thank you so much, Sarah. This was amazing. Thank you, Devin, Grace, and everyone at the Strom Center. Um, thank you for joining us. Uh, and thanks again to the donors who made this event possible. And please save the date for this year's Samuel and Alta Strom Lectures in Jewish Studies uh, between May 2nd and 4th. Um, Anthony Mordechai Sweet Russell, an internationally acclaimed vocalist, composer, and arranger specializing in music in the Yiddish language will perform with accomplished Dimitri Gaskin. Through oration in arts music, they will take us on a melodic journey through a variety of disparate elements that synergize to shape Russell's unique genre of Jewish musicality. We will now end the webinar. Thank you all. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.